Hello, welcome back. And we're going to continue with our review of scale extra cars that feature in the 1980s catalogue. And today uh, we're going to be looking at the Mini 1275 GT. It's hard not to use words uh, like iconic when looking at these scale electric cars because they are all built based around uh, very successful cars. I mean, the idea of the company is to sell models and of course people are interested in those models that they see um, on the roads or on the TV um, racing and uh, competing. And so it's no surprise that the, the Mini 1275 GT makes it onto the list of cars that scale electric sell. Um, the car itself, the original, or the real car, I should say, I mean, it, it hailed in, in rallies for, for many, many years in the uh, late 60s, mid 60s to late 60s, uh, all the way through the 70s as well. So a very, very successful car. And indeed, it has made its way into road racing as well. So um, you've got really every angle covered uh, by this particular car for, for car fans. Now, with respect to how this looks, the, the Mini itself, um, I don't believe it's based on anything that actually raced. Uh, I could be wrong, and, and if I am wrong and you know of it, please uh, feel free to comment, let me know. Um, there are so many different liveries that you could choose from, so many different decal selections that you could choose from with regard to the originals. I think that they just made up a, uh, a selection of nice looking decals, colours and, uh, and designs and, and just went with it. Um, the car itself is quite nice. The, uh, I love the flared wheel arches. I think they're a, a really good feature of it. Um, the body detailing itself may be difficult to pick up, but you know, you've got the, the body lines coming here, the door lines going down the side there. You've also got the door handle. Um, if we come around the back, you can see we've got the lights unpainted. You've got the uh, boot opener. Um, you've got the, uh, the lights, the badges, the number plates, all of these features are, are there but none of them are coloured in which is a bit of a shame. Uh, you could do a really good job of this. We've even got, we look on the side here, the, the side indicator um, and as we move around to the front we've got the typical uh, set of windscreen wipers that are moulded into it. A, a feature that I quite liked and I picked up on was this rear windscreen. This is typical of the period of windscreens, uh, rear uh, rear windscreens where you have the heated elements that go down um, and lastly at the front if you look at this bit here we've got the the rear view mirror as well so the car itself is very detailed um, but none of those details are really highlighted which is a real shame inside this model we have a, a driver figure we have our driver figure again um, just uh, a basic driver figure but again a complete cockpit with regard to it having a steering wheel and seats and the driver so that's quite nice as well um, there is detailing on the wheels you've got this silver band um, quite common on, on these sorts of cars and uh, it just lifts the model a little bit if you ask me um, looking at it from underneath we've got the same standard brush uh, that we've seen previously um, and guide that we've seen previously and again you can identify that we've got the Johnson motor in this particular car. But what I will say about this car and, and we'll compare it very quickly to our Ferrari um, 312 T3 is the wheelbase. Um, if we line the wheels up at the back you can see that the Ferrari is much longer the whole car, you know, I mean, we've, we've almost got another third in length going on there. But we've also got a very big width discrepancy as well. So again, looking at the Ferrari and looking at the Mini, the Ferrari is probably a third um, wider than the Mini is. And then finally, uh, whilst it's not as easy to show you on the camera, the height difference between these two, the Ferrari sits very low. All of its centre of mass is down very, very low, whereas the Mini is quite a tall car so all of which leads us to believe that this is going to be quite a tippy affair so we'll have a look inside as we always do um, but again with this car um, like the others that we've been looking at or at least the metro that we were looking at as well this requires you to bend the plastic in order to be able to take the chassis off so i've got to push in the front bumper here and then that will that will allow me to take the body off of the chassis. I don't like that design, as I said before, with the Metro, um, because you're going to risk breaking it. And indeed, it's quite rare, well, not quite rare, but, but certainly it's not uncommon to see the um, bumpers broken when you're looking at buying these cars. And the reason being is that people are having to force that particular part forward 
in order to be able to slide it off, if I can do this very gently, yeah, to slide it off the, uh, off the body itself. So there we go, there's our, our body um, separated from our chassis. We'll come back to that in a second. There are only three parts to the body itself. We've got the glass that pops out, just uh, uh, quite easy to get out. Um, and then we have the cockpit. Now, the cockpit itself is actually held onto the chassis. There's, there's four mounting posts. You've got the, the one here, one here, one here, and one here. And then you've got the opposite inside the uh, cockpit itself and they if i get it right way around they just simply slot onto the top there let me just clip that in there we go so they slot on top there keep keeping that nice and firm so um unlike with our our metro where this cockpit was completely loose there is actually an idea to hold this in um, although more commonly uh, what we see nowadays is that the cockpits get held into the body by, by latches and by clips um, but in this case they've held the uh, the cockpit itself in via these pillars and posts. Looking at the car, again, the, the, the front detailing that's attached to the chassis. Um, we've got the, uh, the guide attached to the chassis. Then we've got this floppy front uh, axle. Again, this is a very common design feature from the late 70s, really, all the way through the mid, mid to late 80s. They were still doing this. Um, we've got the Johnson motor in this one um, in its uh, usual mounted position of inline and then we've got the uh, rear axle clipped into the chassis again you've got the, the bushings here just clipping it into the chassis to hold it in quite nicely so all in all a, uh, a very clean uh, chassis very thick plastic again very common for these cars of this age um, uh, but not much room here for mounting any other features. If I wanted to add weight to this car, I'm, I'm really struggling as to where I could put sufficient amounts of weight in order to be able to help pin this down and improve the handling. Um, however, that said, we haven't seen this running yet, so we'll, we'll cut to that next and see how we go on. So what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll get the car uh, body shell back on, get it prepared and put it on the track and we'll give it the five laps and see how she behaves. And then if there is any uh, modifications that I can think of or anything that we think we should do to it, we will do those. Um, although that said, I think it's nice to be able to try and keep these things uh, stock. I, I'm all for improving things uh, where it's a very obvious improvement or a very easy improvement. But I can't really see anything here. As I say, there's, there's simply not enough room uh, to, to add weight. You could stabilise the front axle, I guess, but um, ultimately uh, we're going to see how this runs. So I'll meet you back on the track and we'll give it a test run. OK, welcome back. One thing I forgot to mention on the review was that the uh, front wheels of the Mini um, sit just off the track. They're very, very close to the track, but they're not quite touching it. Unlike our, our Ferrari 312 T3, where they were way off the track. Um, I don't expect you to be able to see that from here, but the, uh, the car itself is, is nicely planted, so it looks good. We're going to do five laps of the track um, with the aim of seeing uh, the car drive those five laps without coming off. Um, that's not down to my skill, that's down to how drivable the car itself is and how slowly I have to drive it in order to negotiate the, uh, the corners and the straights. Um, our previous two cars, the Ferrari and the Metro, uh, did 6.66 seconds for the Ferrari and then the nine seconds for the Metro. So let's see how our Mini performs in comparison to those. Um, of course, the first lap is just an out lap, and then the timer itself will start as we cross the start finish line for the second time. So let's go. Yeah, I have to concentrate with this. Zero point zero zero. Nine 
Okay, so there we have it. Um, yeah, there's there's uh, there's no getting away from it. This is this is very <clears throat> very difficult to drive, um, very challenging to drive at any speed whatsoever. 9.61 uh, was our fastest lap. 9.83 was our average lap. You have to think back, I mean, to the, the times, um, you know, the, the, the 1980s, um, you know, the kids may well have been given a, a Ferrari set for Christmas and, and, and would have saved their pocket money cleaning dad's car and, and cutting grass to save up and buy one of these fantastic rally cars that, that they see advertised in the catalogues and, and perhaps on TV, um, only to get them and, and find that they're almost impossible to drive at any speed whatsoever. It, it must have been a huge disappointment for them. Um, that said, the, the, the car itself um, has a market. Uh, it can be driven around a track, albeit very slowly. Um, I have driven this more than obviously these five laps that we've just looked at, um, and I've been able to get this under nine seconds uh, as far as lapping here, but that's on my own, concentrating very hard and probably coming off every other lap. So it will go faster than you just saw it go, but, but that's an indication of, of how the car is in, in terms of being able to do those five clean laps just as we've seen with the other two cars. Um, and before we go, I do want to read something out. This is um, something that for me as a, as a young boy, if I'd have had scale electrics or if I was reading about scale electric, this would have really made me excited. It says here that um, this is a, a quote out of the 1982 catalog. It's on page 14 if you wish to go and, and have a look at it. I'll leave a link uh, for you in, in the uh, description. So they say that we have been even more careful to ensure it's like real racing in performance and use. Each car has its own individual handling characteristic and yet responds superbly to driver's demands. So, I mean, you can't argue with the fact that they do have their own characteristics. Uh, the Metro and, and this Mini here, both very, very tippy, and the, the Ferrari, whilst it does tip, much more uh, manageable in, in terms of driving capability. So, well, we'll have a look at some more. We're halfway through our series of six reviews. So this is the third of, of six. We've got three other, uh, in my mind, uh, very exciting cars to have a look at um, with very different handling characteristics across all three. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, making sure that you don't miss any of that, please do subscribe and um, I should be posting a, a video uh, on the next review of the 1980s scale electric catalog cars very shortly. Okay, thank you very much.